What do you do if you're an Oscar and Emmy Award winning actress who's been diagnosed with bipolar disorder? Well, if you're Patty Duke, you become an advocate for those who have no voice and lobby Congress to increase awareness about mental illness and funding for research and treatment. A conversation with Patty Duke, next on Speak Your Mind. Welcome to Speak Your Mind. I'm Dr. Carolyn Phelps, licensed psychologist with the Human Development Center. Patty Duke first found her acting voice as Helen Keller in The Miracle Worker, and like Helen Keller, went on to find her purpose as an influential advocate for those who have no voice. Last spring, when she was in town, she agreed to sit down and talk with me about her remarkable journey from the chaos of an untreated mental illness to a life rich in purpose and relationships. We recorded this last May, and so won't be taking questions tonight. Just sit back and enjoy my conversation with Patty Duke. Thank you so much for being willing to join us on oh. Speak Your Mind. This is such a treat and such a joy. Thank you, Carolyn. You know, I seize any opportunity uh, to speak about mental illness and more about mental health, and I thank you for the opportunity to do that. Well, I think a good place for us to start would be you have struggled with bipolar illness and you have such a fine understanding of what it means to have bipolar illness, but not everyone in our viewing audience may know what bipolar disorder is. Correct. So let's start by your just explaining that for our audience. I'll start by saying that I was, the manifestations started to show themselves, the mood swings and the irritability. Um, in my early 20s, I resisted. I was adamant that there was nothing wrong with me. Everybody else was crazy. Um, finally, there came a low point, and I did finally, at the age of 35, uh, go to a professional, and I was diagnosed. Back then, we called it manic depression. I like that better because it sounds like what it feels like. Bipolar was came about to kind of soften the blow. <laughs> um, and so we've come to know it as bipolar. They're the same thing. My manifestations prior to treatment became, I was, I was still wonderful in front of the American public. But at home, I was outrageous in my anger and my acting out. And was that, that anger. Was that in your manic phase then? It seemed to be both. I seemed to <laughs> keep that core. I had apparently a lot of anger inside. Um, some of it justified and some of it from the mania. Um, all I ever wanted to be in my life was a mom. And during the years before I got treatment, I became the kind of mom that no one wants to be near. My kids would come home from school. They wouldn't know what was gonna be on the other side of the door. Was it the loving, nurturing mom who's gonna overindulge you? Or is it that dark, scary creature who might smack you at any second? Um, I still carry just a little guilt from that time. And, and so part of what we know is that um, when a parent has a mental illness, that that doesn't, when anybody has a mental illness, it doesn't just affect them, it affects the people in their life. And, and it, certainly. It just, I mean, I've talked since getting involved in going out and talking about my illness and um, trying to reach out and get others who may be struggling to go for professional help. It seems to me that the stigma is still alive and well. Um, most of the people I talk to, parents included, they, they shy away from it. If their child had um, whooping cough, they would take them to a doctor. But 
I don't want I don't want anybody to think that my child is off that there's um, something wrong with them exactly I have learned since being in the field as they say that the earlier the treatment that five-year-olds can be diagnosed and treated and when I first entered a hospital where there were little kids five-year-olds four-year-olds being treated I was horrified why are you drugging up these children it's a chemical imbalance of the brain and at the moment all we have to as the key to talk therapy is medication and so I'm a big advocate of that and and we would medicate a physical illness that required medication and we medicate or I should say self-medicate prior to getting professional help with either alcohol or drugs of some kind because we need that demon to stay down was that part of your experience absolutely alcohol alcohol and um, sex I was um, finally came to a point where I realized that I was tired of waking up next to someone I didn't know um, and that as you know uh, is um, a manifestation of the, of mania. the illness of the mania of the mania and so we we see that in many people uh, with mania have that hyp hypersexuality it's just a symptom of the illness not a reflection of of who you are or your even your own value system mm -hmm. necessarily. I can't tell you what a what a relief it is to know that it wasn't um, it wasn't me <coughs> excuse me doing that it was the chemical imbalance of the brain and somehow knowing that made it easier for me than thinking I was just a bad character and so when, when you had when you got the diagnosis was it was that a relief then oh for my you? lord it was like I don't know a million trillion pounds off my shoulders and my heart when the doctor said I, I think you're manic depressive my response was thank God and what I meant was it has a name if it has a name and he came right in and said it has a treatment and then more people have it not just you oh my goodness, you're not alone yes. and I, I will acknowledge that some people are misdiagnosed um, unfortunately psychiatry is still not an accepted proven um, um, what do I, science. Science. Um, I believe it is. And of course, as you well know, there's great work being done in research about isolating where this comes from in the brain and being able to treat it that way. But for now, all we have is medicine and working with a professional. And I think, I think you raise such a wonderful point. We've moved out of uh, psychiatry and psychology has moved out of infancy and we're into toddlerhood now yes um, I'd like to believe we're a little further <laughs> along than that but um, but the brain is so complex and our understanding Precisely. of that just continues to evolve so significantly over time and I think as that evolution occurs but as people like you come forward and talk are willing to talk about their experiences isn't it silly we are such a society that if someone well known comes out about whatever the illness is oh boy we all sit up and take notice why why don't we just take notice of each other why is it the fact that my name can draw X amount of people into a room I don't know it's just one of the injustices <laughs> it, but and, and that's what this show is supposed to do is to draw everyone into the Please conversation come on into draw, the conversation draw everyone into the conversation you so know, that we can move beyond that precisely you know all of these insidious dramatic shootings that we're all watching now as if it was a weekly show um, I believe with very early intervention could have been avoided but it's hard for us humans to accept that a child can be impaired impaired um, I pray that 
some of what I leave behind is the kind of, I can do it, you can do it. And, and tell me how you decided even to come out and to come forward uh, with the fact that you had a mental illness. I couldn't help it. The relief was so enormous to me and the change in our family uh, dynamics was so magnificent, I couldn't keep it a secret. I, I knew there were other people struggling. Well, if I, if I have a, a, a well-known name, then I'm gonna use it to, to leapfrog into coming out about my mental illness and let the chips fall where they may. I have no idea if it cost me anything professionally and if it did that's sad but I don't care you don't this, regret this that. is I do not regret it at all um, you know I'll be in a department store looking at on the rack at sweaters or something and someone will come up to me usually a woman and say thank you you saved my son's life well I didn't save her son's life all I did was say, hey, this is one person's journey. Maybe some things are f familiar to you in that. And apparently she read one of my books and got him help. She, she saved her son's life and he saved his own life by taking the bull by the horns, as it were, and addressing the issue. I think though where we are, you, you know, you're, you're very modest in, in terms of the, the hope that you inspire for people, though, is that that sense of hope, you must have known what it, what it is like uh, to be what in the I black knew, hope, uh, in I the black hole of What I knew was the depression. potential that was available to me if I didn't run away, if I used my uh, celebrity. Um, that may, that maybe there would be attention paid, uh, and I would be doing a show like this to to be able to say to my sisters and brothers, it's okay, and you don't have to be public about it. It's your own private business, but do it. But that's a personal choice that everyone can make exactly. for themselves. Exactly. I just want them to do it, and 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 take from me that I have had a balanced life now for 30 years. And uh, that's hope. Take it and run with it. Now, there are a lot of uh, romantic notions about creativity and mania and, <laughs> and where some people, some people are afraid to get help. Yeah. They think they they'll lose their creativity. And they'll lose the essence of themselves. Yeah, well, I believe that, first of all, you have to address the fear. Um, and there's no way to do that but head on, jump in. I personally feel that I've been more creative since my diagnosis and treatment because I'm not limiting myself. I, you know, everybody knows my business, and so I don't need to hide from it. Which takes up a lot of energy and brain oh, space when geez. people are doing that. Exactly. And that, to me, is what detracts from the creativity. How can you be creative when you're managing... When you can't put... Who you are. Five items in a row mm -hmm. together. I mean, going to the supermarket was a major challenge for me. Um, Yes, I, I believe I've been a more creative actress, but more importantly, I've been a more creative woman, wife, mother, and without the treatment, I probably wouldn't be here right now. Uh, the, as you well know, um, those of us in our situation, untreated, uh, sometimes go all the way and, and commit suicide. That doesn't have to happen. It, but, but we also must lean on our representatives so that the first thing they cut from the budget isn't mental illness. Exactly, exactly. You know, it takes Funding money to do anything. 
And if our Congress is so worried about the mentally ill having firearms in our country, then look at both those things and give back the money you took away from the mental health um, um, system and give it even more because it'll pay off in the end. In the end, you will have citizens paying taxes instead of bullets. And, and did, did you hear that, America, that this is Patty Duke's call to action? You bet. <laughs> I want to see, see you in a million-person march on Washington. <laughs> the, um, let's talk about forgiveness. Oh, my, it's so important. Because a lot of people, once they get help for bipolar disorder, they're able to reflect on the effect that their illness has had on, on family members. Yes. Um, they're able to... Uh, see themselves and there are a lot of people who carry around the burden of the burden of shame you took the word right out of my head uh, first I had to deal with the shame and it is a physiological feeling in me um, then I had to it's almost like part of the 12-step program you go and you find as many people as you have hurt and apologize truly from your soul and don't repeat it again <laughs> which is that that a making amends is not simply I'm sorry I hurt you right it, it, it is, is it is making a change in, action. in behavior uh, for my children I was finally able to give them an explanation not an excuse but an explanation of why mom was like the way she was. Fortunately for me, they were eager to forgive me. I wasn't, I wasn't sure that I could accept their forgiveness um, until I finally came to a place where I could forgive myself. How did you do that? Because that is the thing I think we as human beings struggle with so much is that, is that self-forgiveness I think I came to a point in my life where I realized that that was, the guilt was serving a purpose uh, to keep me limited. And I decided that I could get much more done if I wasn't walking around with this monkey on my back. And that has proven to be true. I think sometimes too when you know, when we watch people in our life being willing to forgive us, there is that moment where that we have that opportunity to say, maybe I can stop beating myself right. up. If and you can, you, I'm telling you, you can actually feel the unburdening, the muscle, muscles relax and the unburdening and that, that thing in the pit of your stomach is actually gone. I mean, it doesn't come like that. But one day you notice it just, it isn't there anymore. And I think that guilt is a form of egotism. Um, it's still saying, oh, I love I'm that. the center of this whole I issue. love that. Anyway, that's my opinion, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> I, I, think, I think maybe more of us should stick to, to that. that. That is wonderful, because I think that I don't want to be that egotistical person, and then that means I have to give up the guilt because it's really not all about That's right. me. It's a tool to keep you in a negative space. Absolutely. Absolutely. In your own family now, because you have this balanced life. That doesn't mean I can't be happy or sad. I lost my sister a year ago, and, and I don't think I have fully grieved yet. I kind of was chosen to be the strong one. And I've had a physical ailment in the last couple of months, digestive issues. And just this morning, I started to wonder, is this how I'm grieving the loss of my mm -hmm. sister? Because she died of pancreatic cancer. I don't have that, but I have distress in that area. And when that dawned on me this morning, I thought, oh, wow, I have to really do some some work, some work to see if, you know, 
to see if even this lady who can go out and talk about her own mental illness maybe still has some um, tools that need to be tweaked. And it, it, but that, that's a process we all need to do throughout our life. I don't, guess don't, it is. Don't you think we that always think that there's a finish line. That we're finished, line. but, no, but we ain't a, finished till we're finished. Oh, wait, <laughs> right, right. I, I just want to keep walking down the journey, and in my own mind, think about about it as I get to go on to the new mistake. I can stop <laughs> making this old mistake, and I can go on to a new mistake. Thank goodness. That's very good. That's wonderful. See, you are really wonderful at allowing a person to reveal themselves. You make it very safe. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. The families talk about the importance of family, both in terms of being able to help other family members. Well, I, of course, think that family and friends are the unsung heroes because they are the ones who get most of the um, most of the garbage of our out of control personality when we're when we're not treated um, it's a terrible burden that we put on parents and our own children uh, and in a perfect world, we could go to a doctor just we, as we would with diabetes and follow the doctor's recommendations. And we don't yet. Maybe, maybe more of us do now than 30 years ago. But it needs to become as easy and natural as any other kind of illness. And I think that family can be so critical in helping people. Oh my! And and they need help too. You know it. Absolutely. You can't just fix the the scab. <laughs> you have to fix the entirety. I mean, everybody is a, a wounded warrior related to a bipolar person. We are on the verge of running out of time for oh, for this it's been so for this interview. Doctor, don't let me go now. <laughs> the um, I, I don't want to let you go. Uh, I want this. Uh, we're going to do an entire season of Speak Your Mind of only Patty. Oh my! The, well, um, you know me. I I can just run on. <laughs> the um, but what would your message of hope be? That there is hope. That it's real. But it takes the person slash patient to really want to seek it out and and follow up with the treatment and again it'd be wonderful if we could bring family members into that um, as we've noticed with these shootings um, from so-called mentally ill young men um, we're having trouble with the the HIPAA laws. You know, parents can't get information, so how are they supposed to be helpful? I don't know what to do about that except to try and change the HIPAA law to be more reasonable without, um, without interfering with someone's privacy. Another call to action from Ms. Patty Duke. <laughs> Which is uh, what I, I love about you is is that it, is that you you aren't just talking about hope. It's how to put hope into action. Precisely, because precisely. hope cannot hope doesn't go anywhere if it just stays within yes. us. And, and the other thing I've noticed change. on a personal level is that there's safety in numbers. If I, I was kidding about the million uh, person march on Washington. But maybe I'm but not maybe really not. kidding. But maybe, but maybe, maybe not. Maybe if, if Congress could see, and they like to deal in numbers, if they could see the vast uh, population that can't work now because the, their illness is in the way, so therefore they're not paying tax, and it could all turn around. Well, we could be the richest country again ever. And to understand that mental illness isn't a them, it's an us. It's an us. It's an us. It's definitely an us. And with that, I'm, 
I thank you so much. Oh, I thank you for doing this show. For joining us. You are, you are making magic with it. You really are. Thank you so much. Thank you, Carolyn. And thanks to our viewing audience for joining us. I'm okay. going to share this little geek story when I was 17 years old and played Helen Keller <gasps> in The Miracle Worker. Oh. Patty Duke was my inspiration and my hero. Who knew that all these years later, <laughs> our paths would cross, which means there's hope and you never know what's gonna happen in your own life if you hang in there. If you open up to it. And I wanna say right now, Patty, you continue to be an inspiration oh, for me. Vice versa. <laughs> Thank you so Thank much, you. Carol. That's a true story. Is she, is she incredible? She is still my inspiration. Her story really isn't one of bipolar disorder. It is one of hope, of honesty, and grace. May we all be so blessed to bring that into our own life. And don't forget what she said, hope is an action verb. And don't forget to visit us on the web at speakyourmindonline.org where you can find a schedule of our topics and resource links and read my blog. You'll want to join us next Thursday for our final program of the fifth season when we talk about getting to happiness. Who doesn't want to do that? I'm Dr. Carolyn Phelps. Thanks for watching and good night.